Enda, do I have a motion to suspend the rules? Second. All right, I have a first and a second. All in favor? Oh, any discussion, I'm sorry. All in favor? All right, 7 0. To our policy agenda, we're substituting item 4D, the resolution only declaring tax increment bonds in the amount of $78 million. To our consent agenda, we're adding 5 double V, resolution to approve and authorize one source purchase of nine radar systems. And we're adding item 5WW, resolution authorizing a budget, excuse me, budget amendment in the amount of $2,222.99 for the purchase of a printer for the clerk of council's office. All right, guys. All right, first by George, second by Kendi. All in favor? Unanimous. All right, at this time, we'll move on to the Present uh, presentation agenda, the mayor's report. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm gonna try and read for a change here instead of winging it, so bear with me a little bit. But um, let me begin by acknowledging the passing of Joel Miles, the mayor of Wiggins, on Sunday, December 13th. Sadly, his death was due to complications of COVID-19. He was a brother mayor, a good friend, and a public servant to the city he loved. On behalf of our city, I wanna offer our condolences to his family his friends, and to the people of Wiggins. Today, welcome everyone in the council room and those joining us remotely to the second city council meeting of December 2020. Earlier this year, at the State of the City address, I proclaimed, 2020 just sounds good. Aren't you really excited about 2020? Well, I'm done with predictions, but with one more meeting and 16 days left in this year, the news is we have survived 2020. We all know the coronavirus pandemic is not yet over, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. And this is a time, and this is not the time to go over the many hits we took this year or how we were able to keep on moving. Together through FY 2020 and now we're navigating through 2021. It's appropriate to offer appreciation to everyone who has played a part in accomplishing the many things that we've done and everything that we're trying to do now. So thanks to the members of the council, to the administration, to each department, every city employee, and to the citizens of Biloxi. At this point, there are three things I wanna cover. I'm confident you'll appreciate how important they are to Biloxi's future, and it's the basis for my optimism. First, the city of Biloxi's class two fire rating City of Biloxi was, was uh, notified that its fire insurance rating was raised from class three to class two. Class two is currently the best class achieved in Mississippi. Only Biloxi and Gulfport have achieved a class two rating. It means that Biloxi Fire Department is rated in the top 2% of the fire departments in this country. Many factors are considered during evaluation. It certainly helped that we built two new fire stations a fire training tower, purchased two new fire trucks, and added nine firefighters. And it's not just, not just numbers of uh, firefighters, pieces of equipment, but everything from codes, fire codes, uh, the fire, uh, water infrastructure, internal departmental structure, to ongoing training. Biloxi and its fire department have the whole package. The insurance commissioner, says the savings between fire classes has always been difficult to explain. They best try to address it in generalities between major lines of business. The MSRB dwelling fire manual says the reduction from class two to class two, from class three to class two, is from one to one and a half percent for frame and masonry buildings. But in commercial lines, the difference is minus 4% for frame and joisted ma uh, masonry and 3% for masonry non-combustible fire resistant constructions. They also say that there's significant value when soliciting economic development and businesses to locate in your city to be able to boast a class two fire rating. 
So thank you, Joe. We, we had a little a presentation yesterday, and uh, we're certainly appreciative of this, so it puts us in good stead. Without a doubt, it's a significant accomplishment. Now, another item that we've talked about before is the City of Biloxi's utility billing HCUA debt resolution, re reduction, excuse me. As you know, today our citizens pay about $12 million per year to the HCUA for solid waste and wastewater processing. Biloxi's share of the HCUA debt is about $100 million, or about 42% of that $100 million. That translates uh, up until now to about $3.9 million annually. Early in the pandemic, you remember the success we had in refinancing about $25 million of our bonds. I pointed out a similar opportunity during the HCUA budget preparation uh, about four months ago. The same team that helped Biloxi was engaged to determine exactly what could be done. It was complicated. The number of different bonds and the rates, including 20, a $20 million stabilization component called a swap that needed to be paid off by 2025. The value of the swap was in, is inversely uh, tied to the interest rates. The lower the rate, the higher amount of money you have to pay off. But in summary, a little less than $100 million, including the swap, was refinanced about from about 4.9% to 2.1%. For Biloxi, that means about $1.33 million annually in, in reducing our debt budget from $3.9 million to $2.7 million. It begins in January 2021. And the bottom line is what is proposed today on uh, Ordinance A, the first reading. When implemented, it, it adds a debt reduction credit to every account that has a HCUA charge, uh, charge collection, increasing, uh, decreasing a 30, 30 cents from, oh, excuse me, I read the wrong thing. The bottom line is what was proposed on this, this agenda, a debt reduction credit to every account that has a HCUA charge. 50 cents per thousand gallons to everybody uh, up to 25,000 gallons per month. A five year 3% stepped increase in water rates was implemented in FY 2017 to stabilize the utility fund and to help fund the things that needed to be done. In FY 21, the garbage collection increase, increased 30 cents from $14.80 to $15.10. Now, on the screen, I think, are comparisons of what that means to a 4,000-gallon user. And you have it before you, I think, right? All right. Just note that our neighboring cities uh, will be paying that amount during this fiscal year. But as implemented, starting, hopefully, we'll say in, in uh, some cycle within January or February, as fast as we can get it, it'll put us uh, at about $44 a month versus 48 to 51, 48, 51, 62, and 67. <coughs> For a great percentage of our citizens, we've rolled out the, we've rolled back the impact of the rate adjustments for the future and, and strengthen the future ability to, fu to fund projects. The City of Biloxi Development Incentives, before you today, Resolution C and D, are truly significant development opportunities that Biloxi and Harrison County together have in its near-term future. Both incredible transformational projects, totaling nearly $1.8 billion in investment. I presented detailed data to you previously on both U Music Broadwater and the Tivoli projects. And each project is, is expected to generate two to 3,000 uh, construction jobs and two to 3,000 permanent jobs. I've, I'm prepared to go over each approach during resolution discussion. It's important to note that our partners at the Harrison County Board of Supervisors yesterday passed without opposition similar incentives considered by you today. And uh, Mike, I think that concludes my report. So uh, Mayor, you're saying a uh, fire rating of two, big deal? It is a big deal. 
Uh, again, it's hard to pin down, but certainly your, rate, your rates will not increase due to those, those rating. Again, expect mm -hmm. one to 1.5 percent according to these manuals. But uh, again, there are other factors, many factors in determining what your actually fire insurance coverage will be. And, and but the impact made is, is the major impact is when commercial businesses uh, could be as much as 4 percent. And you're saying that uh, citizens like me with a 4,000 gallon per month usage of water are going to get a, a kickback, if you will, a credit of about $2 on a right. bill? That's right. Again, almost reversing those those uh, stepped up percentages in the, the table that was passed in 2017. Sharing, sharing that uh, reduction. The debt service reduction, yeah. With your, with your customers. Right. Uh, you know, the first move, of course, you know, uh, it, the amount was considered and also considered the amount of funding we needed to do for a number of projects that we have to go from year to year. So that's the bottom line, and I'm happy to address any, any questions now or, or later with regard to what I've said. But there are three important projects that uh, you know, we should note, and, uh, and, and again, is the basis for my optimism to go to 2021. And that concludes my report. Any so you're saying, Mayor, that the, uh, the future is going to be so bright we'll have to wear shades? I, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> you can wear shades, but, you know, we're not. No, that, that does. That, that's, I'm done. Can I ask you a question there, Mayor? Go ahead. We know that it's always great when you do, you do that. The interest rates are so low. It saves us a ton of money. Is any of these smaller bonds that we had that we could pay off? We looked at that. Uh, there's some SRF loans that we can't get below, I think uh, Mike just did some research of 1.9 and 2.1. We can't lower what we were doing. The bonds, we, you know, we, what we did address uh, is not going to save us any money. We would rather be, as, as you, before you, I think we talked about the ability to get through, you know, the, the receivable cash flow challenges with a credit line and, a, a, you know, a possible Oh, till they we're reimbursed, it wouldn't do us any good to go borrow that money and pay it off because we'd be probably paying it at, at 2.1 to maybe 2.5 percent interest. Same thing. Same thing. thing. That, 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 those three loans, I think, total about 60,000 per month, and they come right off the top as the state uh, sends us our sales tax money. Is that accurate? Mike? Correct. Yep. Another thing, I know a lot of uh, tax abatement we give people isn't some of them coming off this year too. Would they be paying full tax instead of fifty percent? Tax abatement. In the yeah, company? there are a number of on our rolls right now. There are a number of, and have been a number of abatements. And Jerry knows just generally how many. Because uh, uh, early on, I think in fifteen and sixteen, we kind of uh, locked in on tax abatements. Not not so much this big project, but five year fifty percent, and we had a number of those, and one or two that will roll off on seven years. But we did experience a, a pretty good percentage in increase of ad valorem taxes as those incentives roll off, and we expect this, a similar thing here. Thank you. Any other questions? Kenny? Mayor, on the um, Harris County uh, Utility Authority fees, and I know there's different ways to calculate and assess these, but uh, in the future, is, is, could there be any, any uh, consideration to calculate our off-season residential usage and then come up with a calculation versus the summertime, because in the summer people are using water for their pools and, and other uses than just the regular metered water that goes through the system and, and used for, for you know, regular water and, and sewer yeah, usage. There, there's a number of approaches on, on that. Uh, again, you note if you have a separate meter for those kinds of things, watering yards or, or uh, pools or sprinklers and those kinds of things, some of those fees will come off. If it's a regular meter, one meter for everything that you have in the house, the computation is three dollars and eighty cents per thousand gallons for debt service. Uh, you, you know, for the debt service that we're trying to retire, and uh, uh, that's what we thought we could uh, uh, pass on, and yet keep us the ability to fund some projects that may come up, or some of the things that we're we're deferring uh, right now. But certainly. Uh, we're open to, to what makes sense. Again, we kept this, the, this uh, reduction to 25,000 gallons. The big users are the, you know, uh, the people who use 10 million gallons a month are the people we got to build capacity, and that's pretty much a reason for debt service, and the debt service and the, the usage is, is related to the meter at the, uh, the two plants that we have processing wastewater. 
So uh, I thought it was, uh, we thought it was, you know, uh, uh, prudent to, uh, you know, not send everything back, but certainly give a big percentage of the, the debt uh, uh, reduction. You know. But we're open to everything. Uh, again, even before this reduction, we were, we were lower than everybody else. And now it really removes all doubt and almost reverses for till 2023 that stepped increase is based on that 50 cents per thousand. Sure. Yeah, so it, you're, talking about, you're talking about uh, like the Mississippi Power, they, they, and if you want to, you can have like a flat rate that's an average through the year instead of going up and down and up and down. Is that what we were suggesting? It kind of the same way. I've been doing a little bit of research on fees and we're, again, it's not just the city of Biloxi mm -hmm. that, that we're the only city in the world that they, this is across the country that they assess mm -hmm. these fees. It's not abnormal. But there are some municipalities that take an average of off-peak off for residential and then average that and come up with a calculation uh, oh, to assess those residents. So, so maybe down in the, in the future, maybe I, I'll, I can get some information and forward for consideration. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. All right, any other questions? All right, if not, we'll move on to council's reports. Dr. Tisdale. Thank you. Um, Couple of comments. The uh, just to give, I guess, Public Works a heads up. I've noticed that the striping on Pass Road and some of the lateral streets, pedestrian crossings, and things like that, just over time wear. So, a lot of those are wearing away. Are hard to see, particularly when the when the weather's bad. Uh, I would, and I've done this before, but I, I attend the community courts sessions. They meet once a month, and I. I just got to say, Judge April Reddy and the prosecutor is uh, Robert Horensky and the code enforcement officers that provide all the documentation for all the cases that are heard just do an outstanding job. They keep it moving. They're very professional. Uh, as they say, sort of stuff gets done. So uh, in a professional manner. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm excited to see item NN on the agenda today. That's resurfacing DeBees Road with uh, Partners, Gulfport and Harrison County, the first step in getting that done. Thank you very much, Mayor and uh, Mr. Leonard for that, the administration. Also, I want to thank uh, Councilman in, in Ward 7, Nathan Barrett, for inviting the rest of the council members to the Wool Market Christmas Parade. It's, uh, it's always a treat and a hoot, and it wasn't as well attended this year, but it was bad weather, of course, the virus and everything. But still, they had a, I, I guess, uh, Per capita, each participant, not each participant, each attendee got more beads than they had in the past, I think it would be safe to say. Mm -hmm. uh, with that, I'd like to wish uh, everybody here and, and those who may be watching have a very Merry Christmas. I believe we took a, a socially distant uh, <coughs> together, the four councilmen. <laughs> it hadn't surfaced yet, has it? But anyway, without our mask, we were... You know, I saw that, and, and one thing struck me, and that, that was... Nathan is the only one who is able to hold his tummy in during the <laughs> photograph. Hey, Thank you. Speaking of, speaking Thank of you, socially Nathan. distancing, Councilman, I don't know if you've noticed it. If you've been into West Marine, the, the store West Marine lately, they have an, a unique uh, approach to social distancing. They require you to be one fathom apart. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, <laughs> Ms. Newman. Mr. Lawrence? You know, I'd like to echo what uh, Paul said. We had a good time. I rode another red convertible. Didn't have my girlfriend this time or somebody else, but I'll tell you what, this guy plays some bad rock and roll music. <laughs> I could have rode around all day with this guy. I mean, it was awesome. <laughs> the play was good. People was out there. Everybody had a good time, you know. And it's a good way for us to recycle the Mardi Gras beach, you know. So that, that was a good thing. Going back to business-wise, could you give us an update on the debris? Are we online? Is things still in order on all the debris pickup? I'll, I'll share with you before we leave a, a, a copy of today's report. We're sitting at, the tab is sitting at $2.9 million right now. And we're approaching 200,000 cubic yards. Uh, the, uh, the teams will go home like they did for Thanksgiving, they'll go home for Christmas on the 22nd and come back a week later and start up again. By the end of December, we should have completed our first pass in all the streets. We're doing two passes. So one of the things I've noticed is a lot of people were slow getting their debris out to the curb. 
And so you go into a neighborhood and you'll find, you know, one or two houses have a bunch of debris and everybody else is done. That's not because they got missed, it's because they got them out in generally after the first pass came through. So that's why we're doing a second pass. I, if I had to guess, 210,000, 210,000 cubic yards. Yes, sir. Right. And so many truckloads. <clears throat> 4,494 truckloads. I, I don't know what we could do any differently than what we're doing. I think, and I think um, both contractors, both Crowder Gulf and their sub with all the trucks, and True North, who does the, the checking, have done a pretty pretty good job. If you you councilmen have all one time or another called me about a particular address that maybe might have gotten missed. We pass that on to True North. They go out and check it out, and then try and schedule somebody to go back in. So we're you know we're not in. A, We've tried to, they've tried to be as, uh, uh, as, as good as they could, can be at, at responding to, um, responding to missed um, areas. And they've, you know, they've got GPS on those trucks and they give you a report every day of exactly which streets they've been on. So we, we know where they've been and where they haven't been and, I, and I'm sure you all do too. I mean, they're, they're little pockets of, 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 of of neighborhoods that are kind of, they're gonna to have to be special cases because they have to break the trucks in half and just go with the, the big truck and not without the trailer so they can make the turns and so forth. So in some of that, they're being paid by the volume and weight of, of their material. So their basic modus operandi is to go after a target rich neighborhoods, if you will, and initially where, where they can get the most debris. And in that, because of that case, they miss a lot of smaller little streets, but they'll get to them all eventually. We've got two city trucks working in areas that they can't get to, in particular downtown Biloxi, in little corners of, you know, where we don't want those great big trucks going down Howard Avenue and so forth, but we've got two of our own trucks that are working downtown and other specialty calls that, you know, where we got a problem. In some cases, those big trucks can't get up underneath the power line, whereas our guys can. So that, that you know, if, if if there's people that are missed, it's usually not because we've missed them. It's because their trash is not segregated, or their trash is piled where we can't get to it, or they're a commercial property, and we're not supposed to be picking up from commercial properties. We're not going to be reimbursed for those. Only only now we'll pick up from resident and have picked up a good many commercial properties if the debris is in in the uh, right of way and block in the street or as a safety issue. We pick that up and we, we log it separately when we apply to FEMA, if we should get the chance to do that. If we apply to FEMA, we may or may not be uh, re reimbursed for the commercial properties, but, but we're keeping it separate and we'll make, try and make the case that it was done for safety reasons, so. Does that help? And, uh, one other question too is since uh, Meme and FEMA paying for this, whoever paying for it, is there a cutoff date that we have to quit picking it up? Or we're gonna have a cutoff like middle of January or end of January. I can assure you. I can assure you that cutoff date's gonna be late, uh, late January, early February, when we finish the second through. I I assure you that we're gonna get as much as we can, but there's gonna be stuff left, and it's gonna be left for us to do in, with our own trucks. And I mean, there's just no way around it. There's just too much, too much there, and, and people putting it out late. Um, it's just, you know, we're gonna just have to, there's gonna be a long period of time where we're gonna have to go after some of it by ourselves. But I mean, so pretty much you'll have another month, pretty much all of January. Another month, yeah. Have, right, they could pick up the second. Well, they, they intend to be finished with the first pass of all the streets when they go home for Christmas, 22nd. And, and another thing, I'd like to just ask uh, Kenny, uh, to let everybody know how are we doing with the uh, Margaritaville the White House, the legends, you got all these places you're running. <laughs> Are we doing good? I know you tried to open up the White House. Did that, did that work for y'all? Uh, thanks for asking. Um, the White House uh, opened on Thursday, and we're full steam ahead, and it's uh, a lot of people have uh, come back to the property, and they're glad it's open, and, and they, I guess that is a favorite uh, place in the afternoons for some, and uh, they're glad it's certainly open. Um, legends. Uh, as you know, we opened October 1st. Uh, we, we thought we suffered minimal damage after the hurricane, but discovered that we had some significant roof damage that held some water and decided to release that water a week after the storm. So we're, we're making some repairs there, but 
uh, the restaurant, uh, Sapphire Supper Club, is doing very well. Um, and uh, we, we expect to do the repairs very shortly uh, to the 68 rooms that were damaged and will be at full capacity very soon. Margaritaville is another story. Um, it took wind and water damage significantly, and we expect uh, that it won't open probably through April. Um, we've assessed everything. All the adjusters have been there. Uh, we're in there doing the repairs now. And um, if you saw that big oyster, uh, I remember the days of the uh, oyster shells. We had some carpet almost as high as some of those oyster piles. Well, not quite as high, but it was getting there. And um, so we've replaced a bunch of carpet, and we're making the repairs that the wind, not only did it damage the, the siding of the building, but it, it broke the seals of the windows, so then you would have a bunch of leaks in almost 80% of the hotel. So we're, um, we're fixing that uh, right now. And, um, but we'll be back and open uh, pretty soon, hopefully in time for the summer. And uh, we'll be back in business, and I uh, like like everybody wants to get 2020 behind us, recover in 2021, and, and kind of chase all this success going forward. But Councilman, I, I appreciate you asking. Thank you. Did you capture the raccoon that was running wild? Uh, yeah, we, we also had a raccoon that uh, decided to make Margaritaville home, and uh, with the help of uh, animal control and contacting the city, they were spot on, and uh, they, they uh, captured the the, and relocated safely uh, the raccoon. To, to which ward? <laughs> That's right. Uh, one last thing for the mayor. You said you're gonna give us a total update on all the harbors and the piers and everything. Do you have anything on that this week? I think uh, we talked about it. The so far as being all, um, all the piers that are shut down and like the harbors, where are we at with the harbors and everything? Okay, let me say the, the harbors are, are, are waiting some, uh, some actually quotes to do what needs to be done at Point Cadet and some of the other ones. Uh, we've uh, salvaged some of the uh, Biloxi Lighthouse Pier, and they've just repaired, and I think, Billy Ray's here, I think they just opened the Forest Avenue Pier that was uh, lacking some boards, but we were able to salvage some of the, the Lighthouse Pier, and uh, I think the next sequence of events for piers would be uh, Porter Avenue, which has a few boards, uh, missing, as well as the Oak Street on the beach side and Oak Street, the former DMR Pier. Those are the, the sequence. So we're actually repairing what we can without having to go buy, you know, significant um, pieces of uh, marine lumber. Appreciate that. I'll just keep it up, you know, because so much of that stuff sits in Ward 1. Yep. I get a lot of phone calls on those things. There's, there's a lot of people involved in that, the boats, whatever. So it's always people calling and asking about those yep. things. So that's why it's following up. But you got to remember what you stated early in 2020. You know, when tough times are here, Biloxi even gets tougher. Yeah. We're just tough people. We've been through a lot of bad things, <laughs> and we just we just live through it, come right on back, and most of the time we come back bigger and better, and that's what we're doing right now. It's the easy thing. Even you folks. I'm, not <laughs> I'm not predicting. I'm not predicting. Anyway, thank you all. Mr. Deming? With regard to the debris pickup, I think we've gotten mostly through my ward, and I, I do want to commend the groups. Made a couple calls, and I mean, they were out there before I could do back uh, follow-up calls to see if they had come back through. Very, very efficient, so good work with those. Um, you sent us an email, Mike, regarding some new software for police dispatch and <clears throat> um, service, some service management or something like that. Uh, in it, it referenced a take-home package. Do you have that prepared for us? I will have it when you when we're finished here. Okay. Find out. Now we've gotten a poll on uh, participants for we, we were able to, um, even though the uh, Motorola company was digging her heels in, they were able to, we were able to convince them to wait until the 29th when we could uh, not have to have a special meeting. So it'll be on the agenda for the 29th. Okay. But I'll have a package for you to take home. All right, and I have some some uh, discussion regarding the water meter that George was discussing earlier, the HCA UA stuff. So I'll reserve that for when it comes up on the docket. Um, is um, engineering, Christy? Look, no, you don't have to get up. I got your email with the update information about the. 
the cones, the delineation cones for uh, Pops Ferry and, and an update on the proposal for the sidewalk and the, for the proposed date for the sidewalk. So thank you, just wanted to acknowledge that I received that. That's all I have. All right, Mr. Glavin. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to wish the entire council, the mayor, all our directors and all our city uh, employees uh, that they have a very warm Christmas and, and enjoy the holidays coming up. Um, and, you know, Mayor, your report, thank you for that report. You know, especially uh, this, the, the fire department and uh, getting our fire rating reduced. We've had many meetings that we talked and discussed about that was a, a, a high priority. And, uh, you know, to see those two fire stations go up, it's, it's more about just the fire rating, even though that was one of our goals to reduce the insurance rates. It's to improve the safety, to, to improve the uh, resources to provide to our fire department so that we can respond to calls and get to people that need help quickly. And uh, we're able to do that today better than we've ever uh, been able to before in the history of our great city. Um, the other thing, as the mayor touched on, from economic development, other developers and uh, people that are gonna invest in our, our city are gonna look at those fire ratings because it doesn't affect us just in Ward 6 or Ward 7 where the new fire stations are. It, the fire rating applies citywide. So if you're gonna invest in East Biloxi or you're gonna invest in Wool Market or, or Ward 6 or other places, uh, we become a place that is very attractive. One place in particular is the Blake. Uh, it was doing some site, uh, some tours the other day, and I talked to some of the uh, management uh, group, and they said one of the number one reasons that they, their first choice was Gulfport. One of their number one reasons that they decided to change the location was because of that fire station being right across from that senior living home. So it goes to show you how that, you know, how we're forward thinking and working for a better Biloxi truly makes Biloxi better. Um, and add too, taxes was mentioned also, so we're lower. Uh, that's a big consideration. I had the same conversation. With the no, no doubt. So it's all working, and in, in this administration and, and the work that we do is to, to certainly be commended. Um, I also want to follow up on another thing. Uh, Beverly Martin, uh, her office contacted me the other day. Uh, Christy, I don't know if you got my message, but I forwarded it uh, to you that the her road supervisor, Tim wants to get with us on that drainage ditch that we talked about. So uh, it sounds like they do have some interest in moving forward in that and kind of collaborating with our, our resources and efforts on, on getting that drainage ditch um, over at Watersview uh, maybe cleared out. And again, in all our awards, we should be able to, uh, long-term thinking, figure out a way that we can put a maintenance plan into, into effect that we can clear those jungles out because they're truly jungles and it didn't happen on this watch. It's happened over several decades actually that these drainage ditches, what they were intended to be, have turned into these jungles and, and debris that has fallen into them and they don't function like they should. And um, so hopefully we can continue to keep our eye on the ball on that as well. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, Nathan, uh, you know, I apologize my regrets for missing uh, your parade. It's been a very special event, uh, unfortunately, or in my case, fortunately, uh, my grandson, the Croatian kid, was in Daphne, and we called it Mudville. It was raining that day, and uh, they had, those kids had a good time. They finally were able to play in the mud uh, for, for a game or for a tournament. Uh, but barring another tournament next year, I'll be sure to put it on my agenda to kind of kind of support you with that. And with that, that concludes my report. Mr. Gines. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I want to extend my sympathy to the mayor of Wiggins. Um, just like the mayor said, a very good man. Me and my son had the pleasure of spending a whole day with him and his wife. So um, much, much uh, extended love to that family. I um, also want to congratulate Chief Boney on that fire rating. Uh, public Works. I've seen Public Works working in the community, uh, cutting grass and um, 
cleaning up the sidewalk. So I thank Billy Ray and his crew. Um, but I would like to uh, ask the CEO, Mike Leonard, uh, about rearranging some of the schedules uh, for the trucks. I would like to ask that they come down Division Street you just kind of clean up Division Street for us because that's our main thoroughfare. So if you can kind of redirect them to get Division Street, um, that will help me out a whole lot. Um, uh, Mr. Rohde, I'd like to just uh, ask Mr. Rohde a quick question. Um, how close are we on the striping? Striping. They're going to try to get in here by the end of the year, Councilman. Uh, they've got two other uh, clients that they had already pre-booked before this project, but gotcha. they did have us down that if there's a window of opportunity, they would they would do so. If not, it'll be at the first of the new year. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. All right, and um, I'd like to wish the Council, everyone out there in our listening audience, a uh, very Merry Christmas, and to all who I don't see, a Felix Navidad. <laughs> that concludes my report. <laughs> Appreciate it. That never gets old. <laughs> uh, I have several things. Uh, first, I'd like to start by thanking everyone um, that was involved, the police department, um, public works, putting the cones out, Sherry helping organize um, on the parade. Those that attended, thanks. Um, it was fewer participants and a smaller crowd, but we're glad that we were able to offer that again this year. Um, I have on the debris pickup, Mike, I got a call from Jason Overstreet on my way here, and he said they're gonna start on those ditches um, on Wool Market Road, and some of the debris on Wool Market Road on the east end hasn't been picked up yet, and he said that that's gonna prevent them from working in some of those areas. So he said if there's any way that we can get that taken care of, that would be great. And then also on the debris pickup, um, I know that these guys are hauling a lot of stuff and, and you can see the, the piles disappearing, but you, you mentioned a first pass and a second pass, and I'll just take my street for instance. Um, yesterday they came down and picked up on our street, but left piles, truck wasn't full. And I've had somebody tell me that somebody told them, like you said, they go where basically where the bang for the buck is and that they're bypassing smaller piles and go, they'll go down a street and get the big piles and leave the small ones because it, the time that it takes to set the truck up, get it up and all that, isn't, they're not getting as much money as going to a big pile, filling the truck up and, and going and dumping it. I don't know if that's the case or not but there are multiple streets that I go down that have been hit and these guys go in and leave and they don't finish the street. So when you say a first pass and a second pass, does this, them going on that street and the GPS showing that, they be, that they've been there constitute a first pass on that street? Because I know for a fact, and there's many streets out in my ward, I don't know if it's happening like this everywhere in the city, that they're going and they're getting a majority of it even, but there are piles and it's not under a power line or anything like that. There's piles that are still there. And so I would like to know, you know, why they're leaving these piles in these, you know, in these areas, um, if we can find that out. Um, other than that, I know that they're hauling a lot. I see them throughout the ward all the time. That's just the one concern I have is them leaving piles on the street when power lines aren't impeding them or anything from getting them up. Um, the next thing is on, on our uh, executive order for COVID, um, I know that we're not implementing anything in excess of what the governor has implemented, but I've gotten a couple of calls and some Facebook messages um, that certain businesses are being treated differently or maybe not be treated differently, but some, some people, things are being enforced, some aren't being enforced. Um, and, and it's specifically bars, clubs, things like that. There are some clubs that are going all night long and then some that we're going into and basically saying, if you don't shut down, you know, and I know that some of them, ABC's gotten involved and things like that. I know it's not all the city, but personally, 
you know, I'm not for shutting someone down at 11 o'clock. We're responsible adults. We know if we can stay home, I mean, you know, if you, you can stay home if you want to, um, but I, we, we either need to enforce it for everyone or, and I don't, I'm not even saying it's intentional, but it is happening. And so it needs to be enforced for everyone or it doesn't need to be enforced at all um, because it's making it look like the city's showing preferential treatment to one versus another. And, um, and like I said, it, it, it might not be intentional. Another um, complaint has been that they'll make a phone call to ask a question as far as what the regulations are in regard to COVID. And this person may call and they'll get this answer and someone else call and they get another answer. Um, someone recommended possibly having a, a sheet that anybody who would fill the call in the city could go off of so that they're getting the same answer no matter you know who they call or when they call. Um, some kind of reference sheet. Um, that, and that's just a couple of um, things that I've got. Um, Public Works, Kenny brought that up. Uh, they're doing a great job. I know that um, we're, we're understaffed in Public Works and in regard to the um, ditch maintenance that he was referring to, I would like to possibly see us even contract some of that out because we do have a lot of ditches that aren't being maintained. And if we don't maintain them, it's the ones that are in terrible shape now are going to get worse, and the ones that that aren't, if you know, they're going to eventually get like that. So if we could get something set up, um, you know, after the first of the year, we could sit down and come up with some kind of plan or something. But we have to take care of these ditches, and it, it, it's overwhelming. We don't have enough people north of the bay to to get all these ditches cleaned out that need to be. Um, it's just not possible. They could work all year on just ditches and probably not finish it. And there's much more to do than that. So if we could look at an alternative, possibly outsourcing some of that um, to a company or something after the first of the year. And I believe that's all I have. And we'll now move to the public agenda, citizen comments. We have a total allotted time of 45 minutes. Each person who speaks can have up to three minutes, and you'll need to come forward to the table, sign your name in, and tell, um, speak your name and your address into the microphone. Do I have anyone on my left and your right side of the room that would like to speak? Anyone on my left, your right. Anyone on my right, your left. Anyone? Dr. Drawdy. My name is Larry Drawdy. I live at 3485 Brandon James Drive in Wells Ferry Landing. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, um, a few weeks back, we had an unpleasant experience by having a visitor visit us that nobody really liked. And we've had it in the past and people have always actually risen to the occasions and basically taken care of. Public officials, many times when these events occur, get a lot of criticism, and they really don't deserve some of the criticism because they're really working at all ends to try to make sure that everything can be taken care of. They don't always receive the positive comments. And today, I'm here just to mention to our mayor, Ofo Gillage, our chief administrative officer, and to my councilman, Ward 7, Nathan Barrett for the fine job that they have done in removing the debris. I've heard several of you comment about the debris removal, and I will tell you in Wells Ferry Landing, they did a superb job of taking care of all the debris that was actually basically in that uh, particular area, and I thank them for it. 
Also in Ward 7, we're very fortunate to have a superintendent out there that's in charge of public works named Mike Hoaxley. And he does, to me, a marvelous, marvelous good job. And I cannot speak for the rest of the wards, but I will speak for Mike out there in Ward 7. If you call Mike, first of all, he's always going to call you back. Number two, he's going to tell you, yes, he can do it, or no, he can't do it, and he'll explain why. And that's, the, that's really the good thing about it. But I have always asked him in the past to take care of some basic particular th things that need to take care of, and especially in, in Ward 7, but also in uh, Wells Ferry Landing, of which I'm basically concerned with, and he has jumped to the occasion to always take care of it. So, Mayor, thank you. Mike, good job for those things like this, and to the members of the council, I thank you for that. And uh, to me, uh, we're going to always have debris in Biloxi because of hurricanes, because unfortunately, we're probably, if we live long enough, we're going to see us some more. So, but we don't want them, but uh, we know we're going to get them. So, but uh, thank you for the good job that you've done. And I wish each one of you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And thank you for letting me come. Thank you, Dr. Doherty. Appreciate that. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Dr. Drawdy. Anyone else on my right, your left? All right, is there anyone in the back of the room? Okay, all right. Um, Dr. Tisdale is going to read uh, some letters that we've received um, as public comments from people Thank on you. the um, short-term rental. Right, I've been asked to read uh, a number of letters that have come in dealing, I believe they're all with short-term rentals from citizens, and for those who aren't aware, if you can't attend a council meeting, you can still be heard by sending an email or a letter to the council clerks, and, and they'll, uh, they'll be mentioned at the council meeting. Good afternoon. My name is Carol Porterfield Mazara Vaughn. I'm a resident of Biloxi and own a vacation rental at 128A Lee Street. I've operated this unit as a licensed business since 2017. First of all, I'd like to say I appreciate the efforts of this council to understand the short-term business and adjust the laws as this business has progressed in our city. I appreciate your time dedicated to regulating these properties. What I hope for you to consider is not to regulate and tax it so heavily that we cannot afford to do business in Biloxi. There are tourists that prefer to stay in vacation rentals, and if they cannot find one that is reasonably priced to stay in here, they will go to neighboring towns to book their vacations. The tourists that I have served love this community in return year after year to spend money shopping. They dine in our restaurants, play golf on our golf courses, they gamble in the casinos, they bring revenue. Though it has been our most challenging year to stay afloat due to COVID, the city has decided to charge us an additional $100 a year for an application fee. I cannot help but wonder how many other businesses are required to pay their business license plus an additional application fee of $100 each year. Though this may not seem like a lot to some, it has resulted in us raising our prices in order to save our bottom line. That being said, the majority of vacation rental owners that I have communicated with are paying our 12% sales taxes and following the laws they govern us. We appreciate the Council and Planning Commission bearing down on those that don't pay their fair share. Please consider the benefits to our city of the short-term rental business. Sincerely, Carol Vaughn. The next letter uh, reads, to whom it may concern, I would like to take this opportunity to explain how short-term rentals has saved my financial life. I've been in the casino business for almost 30 years. After several back surgeries, I am unable to work because I cannot stand on my feet for eight hours. I started an Airbnb rental and it has saved my home and, and given me the ability to pay my bills. It's been a godsend to me. Airbnb also allows people with a lower budget to afford weekend getaways. Sincerely, Deanna Johnson. The third letter reads, please accept this as my objection to the above amendment, specifically short-term rentals being specifically prohibited in limited business LB districts. The city has not presented evidence indicating this prohibition would be in the public interest to Biloxi citizens. 
the LB district has a minor aureal extent in Biloxi and allowing short-term rentals in this district would have no significant impact to the quality of life of Biloxi citizens. It is my request that the city amend the LDO to specifically include short-term rentals in LB limited business districts. Thank you for your consideration. Gary J. Cuevas. And the last letter reads, I believe short-term rentals are beneficial in the Bluxy area for tourists to come see our beautiful area. Lots of money is spent in our beautiful city. Another benefit is that we have a beautiful home to rent to the military and their families from Keesler Air Force Base that only need a home to rent for a few months out of the year. Thank you, Laurie Burchick. And if I mispronounce Laurie's name, I apologize. Uh, those are all the letters. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, there are no more comments. We will close citizens' comments and we will move to the policy agenda. We have Ordinance A. Ordinance to amend Section 22232E relating to the sewer rate schedule. Second. All right, we have a, a first by George Lawrence, second by Paul Tisdale. First reading. First reading. So we'll move to Ordinance B. Ordinance to amend the LDO for regulating short-term rental and timeshare uses. All right, do I have a motion? Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was motion by um, Tisdale and myself, Dr. Tisdale. Uh, yes, I noticed that we have seen this on the agenda. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Creel, but this has been on the agenda a number, a number of times in some form or another, and. It just appears the council is reluctant to take this up. Uh, I'm not sure why. It almost failed for lack of a second um, at the previous reading, but uh, I'd certainly like to hear some discussion on this. It seems to me that these are text amendments that um, you're requesting be implemented. I would assume they're tweaks of some a sort or another based, based on the experience through the planning commission and so forth. So you have just a brief summary, Jerry, as, as to maybe why this is coming forward and hopes that we can see some discussion with the, among the council here. Thank you. Well, this is actually uh, the same ordinance that the council had looked at last month. The only thing that we did was, uh, since there was opposition to the no conversion clause, we had the no conversion clause removed. But we had some other things in there that we felt were important. Uh, one was to uh, distinguish the difference between a timeshare and a uh, short-term rental. Uh, in the ordinance, they were they had been lumped together in the same use category. And what we're doing now is using the definitions that come from the American Planning Association dictionary to define them both and, uh, and separating them into separate categories. The other thing that's included in this is the um, requirement for the $100 annual fee to uh, reapply each year. And uh, the, one of the reasons for that is because monitoring short-term rental is very labor intensive. We have to have one person there in the office that does nothing but monitor short-term rental every day and he comes to my door at least three or four times a day with questions about uh, an advertisement that he sees or, or something that uh, may or may not look like it's uh, out of compliance. Uh, but he spends uh, his entire days working on short-term rental. So this, in effect, would have to help to offset uh, some of that. And then again, we uh, had <clears throat> the provision in there that would not allow an existing apartment complex to convert. And if you'll look, you'll see that that has been lined through and has been removed. So these, um, these other things or uh, elements that we felt were needed in the ordinance, it, uh, it clarifies a bunch of things for the, the uh, owner. You said that the $100 has always been in there. That's not, that's not been changed. There are right, uh, would there you ask the attorney to address? I, 
It sounded like it was something that was important, but we had no idea what he said. That's not, a, what you're saying is that's not a text change that's making a difference in this. Like so, so basically, the last time we had, a, if I remember correctly, about an hour discussion on this um, one item, what we did is we basically just went in and took all the short-term rental stuff out and are keeping all the other, um, all the other parts of this ordinance, because we had the timeshare thing in there as well. Is that correct? As we, far as the actual changes that we are origi were originally were originally in this ordinance, we we took out the non-conversion group. Now there are a couple of other things in here that are just housekeeping. We are making it clear that short-term rental would not be allowed in the LB district, the limited business district. Can you tell me what that is? Limited business is the new name uh, for what we used to call professional business district. And it's in areas that are heavily residential where you want to have professional businesses next door that do not generate a lot of traffic and do not generate a lot of noise. So we didn't feel like the LB would be appropriate for short-term rental. The next step up is the NB. And if you'll recall what we did with NB, is we recommended that it be allowed there as a conditional use because those are businesses more like a drugstore or a beauty salon that are also in neighborhoods, but they do tend to generate a lot more traffic and noise. Just for, just for clarification and maybe for mine and other sakes, to help envision that, can you tell me what one of our limited business districts is in Biloxi? There's some on Pass Road. Uh, west of Pops Ferry, uh, some of the properties that run along the uh, area, I believe mostly on the south side, uh, is LB. We have very little LB in the city, but there is an area in there that's I, I, I know for a fact is LB. I have a question, Jerry, on the, the LB. You talking about putting it inside those businesses, or you can't have a short term rental behind them. You know, they're not clear in here what you said. You keep saying you're not going to do a limited business, but I'm, I'm kind of like Robin. I mean, you kind of let me explain it. There's something missing here. Okay. So what's the problem? Okay. Limited business is the zoning designation. It's not the use inside the business. So if the property, the first thing that we do whenever somebody comes to us with a short term rental is we check the zoning. And if the zoning is correct, then the application moves forward. If the zoning is not correct for short-term rental, then it doesn't move forward uh, unless the owner wants to seek a zoning change request. So um, I've tried to make it as clear as I could. I don't know what else I could have said to, to make it more clear. The, um, there are some other clarifications in here, uh, just some places where we've, on the second page, where we've uh, made it clear about uh, RS5 being high density residential, RS7.5 being medium density, and RS10 being low density residential. Those are mainly just typo corrections that were already in the ordinance that needed to be corrected. Are you referring to section 10, subsection D, subsection 1? Back over to that page. This is uh, under short-term rentals. It would be under the section uh, of visitor accommodations 23-4-3D, uh, 10E. If you'll look in the last paragraph on that page, the things that are underlined or the things that were added, and they were in this previously. They were in this the first time that you had a chance to review it. I was just wanted to get caught up to where you were referring to because those zones that you, the section I cited also had everything except for limited business. And then that's why I wanted to see where you were at on the, okay. the um, ordinance. Uh, 
that's pretty much it. I mean, that's uh, that's pretty much the changes. Uh, they're very, very minor. Yeah, uh, I believe that the majority of what the discussion was about has been lined out uh, when whenever we tabled this last time. Yeah. I believe that that the majority of the issues that we had with this has been crossed out. We took that entire section out as you requested. Right, then that dealt with, uh, I think there was a, a motion in a second, but it was voted down to just remove RM20 and RM30 uh, as, as zones where short-term rentals could be operated under conditional use. So that's, I think that's yeah. the section. So we left it as conditional use. It was, yes. That was taken That's correct. Yeah. Now, the council indicated that they wanted to retain uh, that authority. But there, there are a couple of things. I think, um, Mr. Barrett, one, I, I recall you saying somewhere, somewhere along the line, uh, short-term rentals are not it's proposed here that short-term rentals are not permitted in LB, RS5, RS7.5, RS10, RE, RER, A, and AR zones. And I know that you had concern, some concerns about that. We asked we, we ask for a... Um, and we're doing that. We're having a public hearing. Yes. We're, that's a, to, per, to permit it under some circumstances. So if I, if I had a property of 10 acres and I, you know, I'm not close to anybody, I'm on, uh, in, in an agricultural designation or uh, what is it, a residential estate or whatever, something of that size. that Agricultural and agricultural restricted. Correct. Uh, because those were not already, your request was not, re not already in the ordinance, and the ordinance we had advertised already, we can't arbitrarily go back and add that. So we have to conduct a separate public It'll just hearing, be a text change to this. Which is what we're doing now, yes. Right. And, and I can, I believe that would be appropriate under some circumstances. Yeah. The, uh, the other thing I believe uh, I noted was short-term rentals shall provide proof that sales tax records have been submitted to the Department of Revenue. I think that was one concern and I think might have been a sticking point with uh, some of the council members, how do, how do we know somebody has paid or we heard from, I think, a couple of folks who addressed the council under citizens' comments maybe five or six weeks ago complaining that this was too burdensome. And we also heard from a couple of uh, property managers that said, we provide that, it's no problem. But I believe, would, would that have been one of the text changes in here? It, it is. Real, just there. to kind of make it a little easier I think was the intent for those short-term rental owners to prove that they're paying the appropriate taxes. Well, we changed the, we changed the wording somewhat. Um, the, uh, I think it was being interpreted that we were uh, forcing people to bring in their tax records to show us that uh, they had been paid and uh, we took that language out because it was confusing and changed the language to where it says, short-term rentals shall provide short-term rentals shall provide proof that sales tax records have been submitted to the department of revenue showing the city as the short-term rental location or that such taxes have been collected by a third party and we felt that that's what the, the council was requesting so so they, and we only have uh, you had mentioned timeshares and i I think you and I had spoken weeks ago. There's only one timeshare currently operating that Chateau Legrand. That's correct. Yes, they're on Highway 90. Yes, sir. Um, so anyway, I mean, my concern is obviously you, you keep coming back with the, these text changes, Mr. Creel, because they're they're housekeeping items. We're trying to clean this up. Uh, from what I heard from the discussion, there's a, 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 a little tweak on the way dealing with Mr. Barrett's concern on uh, restricted agriculture or uh, agricultural for short-term rentals. Um, but other than what we've talked about today, what was deleted earlier, the council voted down earlier, that was removed in these concerns, I, I would hope we could move forward with the understanding that probably in January at some point, based on this public hearing, for the uh, agriculture restricted or whatever related to short-term rentals that we know that's in the pipeline headed this way, I hope we could move forward on this. But I'm eager to hear other comments as well. All right, Mr. Clevin. Well, our intention at the, uh, at the public hearing is not to refight the short-term rental battle. Our intention is just to consider 
allowing it in agricultural as a conditional use. Okay. And we would hope to limit the discussion to that. All right, Mr. Glavin. Uh, yeah, I got a question for the chair, um, President Barrett. Uh, so if we've made modified the first reading, if we mod made text changes and modified the first reading, how is this a second reading if we modified the first reading? No, we moved this two, uh, week, two weeks ago, whenever mm -hmm. we had our last meeting. I know right? we moved it, but no, we moved the, it in its current form, or has it yes, been modified? Yes, we moved it in its current form. Whenever this was tabled, was like a month so or so. So there's nothing that's been changed since we moved it? The only, at, at Mr. Deming's request at that meeting, the thing, what we did was go back and remove the non-conversion clause, that's all. Otherwise, this is exactly what y'all reviewed at that last meeting. He requested it. Was that a amendment that we requested? Was it amended? Or was it just a request? It, it, to do it's that? actually just a modification of the text change. The amendment is what we're going to be voting on. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It, I know what you're getting at. I think that's a question for Peter. If it violates the standards of first and second reading by changing it within the first reading, I don't know, Peter. If I you would just give us like it in its form as a first reading. It, and if we made the amendments, you know, I can understand that. You know, it should come out of the first reading. We make those amendments at the second reading for it to be even in its current form in the first reading. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I agree with you exactly, and I understand what you're getting at. But again, I think that's a that's a parliamentary discussion that would have to be made by council. I don't have it all in front of me. I'd have to go and see what was actually taken out. I know we we typically between the first and second readings we've we've taken things out. I mean, and we've certainly amended between the first and the second reading. I don't recall if a specific motion was made to amend or not, you know, as opposed to a request. So if I may speak, as as I recall the motion I made the the motion, I made the motion that RM, RM20 and RM30 um, be, that short-term rentals not be permitted in RM20 and RM30 zones. And as I recall, Mr. Lawrence seconded that. And the council at that time voted on it and it was defeated five to two. That's when the, the text was modified and that section removed. Yeah, I believe and what that, was brought okay. forward. Yeah, unless, unless Peter and, and Robert had discussion since our last meeting, this was moved without any discussion last meeting. So unless something was changed that wasn't discussed in the meeting, Okay. I'll move the table. I'll second that. Real quick, I have a question. Why can't we just strike out single family zones and leave every other zone open to conditional use only, meaning we have to approve it? Because every situation is different. So if we just cross out limited business, there might be a situation where it's a perfect location, it's a perfect everything, and they have letters from everyone around them saying that they're for it. I mean, why can't we just leave everything open to conditional use only? So I'm, in a, I'm kind of in agreement with Ms. Newman. I think that if we can have law firms or accountants or some other professional business within a neighborhood, then I think that would be ripe for a conditional use for, um, for short-term rental. Uh, so that's, I would, I would, I would support um, removing limited business from that section of prohibited sections. I don't know if we want to make a motion or if, if, that's, an, if that's just a, a consensus that you would strike through like we've done with removing the, the other thing. But Okay. Uh, so Good I point. I agree with Keno. They want to table it, and if we're going to do that, take limited business. I'll take it out. Just take it out, and when you come back to this, come with that in there already. It's out of there. 
before I mean, there's, you... there's a couple of things that we're looking at here. I've been watching these changes. Did the council recommend all these changes in here, Jerry? Yes, sir. Where did all these changes come from? Just about everything in this is something that the council has asked us to do to gain a, a, a more, uh, a bigger level of control over short-term rental. And I, and I don't mean to smile, it's just that we, we don't even have a carcass left. We beat this horse so bad that uh, there's nothing left to beat anymore. But uh, we're still open to whatever the council desires to put in to the ordinance. We'll certainly consider that. Now, w one thing about this change that was recommended by Councilwoman Newman, if we have a place now <coughs> where we don't allow short-term rental and we're going to change it to where it does allow short-term rental, that's going to be a text change and we would need to add that zoning district to the request where we're considering allowing it in agricultural zoning. So it would, it would take another step. It's not too late to do that. We can do that. Well, we the problem is, like you noted, we've been beating this horse till it's the, you know, way did. Yeah. But the problem is, obviously, the whole council does not agree. So we can just keep going back and forth. But this is where I stand. I don't see why we can't just cut single family zones out and leave everything up to us to decide um, with conditional use only. That's just my two cents, and that's how I feel about this ordinance. I don't know about the rest of them. I know where one stands, but other than that, I mean, that's up to you guys. This and, and we'll be happy to add that to the uh, the public hearing request if that's the direction the council wants to go. Yeah. Mr. Creel, one question, and this is a little bit off the track of, of the zonings, the $100 application fee. Out of curiosity, um, does anybody else, does any other um, market sector pay this type of application fee? Not that I can specify right now. I will uh, I will go back and check though and I can email that information to you. And if you would also, when you do so, look to see how many short-term rentals there are, what kind of revenue this generates for the city. Um, I would like to know how much, we're, if, if we're doing this because the added burden, which costs us more in, in, uh, in labor, then I want to know what that what that ratio is, what we're generating versus what we're paying. And if we if we are generating more than necessary, then we could reduce this. Um, but if it's necessary, we'll have that discussion later. I would just like to know what we are generating currently off of these application fees annually and what we project to generate as we move forward. Well, you know, if let's just say with the 324 short-term rentals that we have right now, you know, you'd be looking at $100 for each one of those. Right. So, so that would be what we would be generating right now off the $100 fee. Right, so that, that's, I mean, you're talking about just around $32,000, $33,000 a year. So that's that correct. covers the salary of one mm -hmm. decently paid well, or medium paid. In, a, in, a, in addition to that, though, there's a burden on the fire department, which now has to inspect these 300 20 locations, which they didn't have to do before because they inspect all commercial buildings. I, I don't know if there are any other burdens, but that, yeah, that's part of those, the two. Thanks. Those are the two main hey, ones. Peter. The fire department, the fire department. Peter, Lucy's, um, they looked it up. The amendments were made. This was on the agenda November 17th. The, any amendments that are in there were made between the 17th and the 1st. So what was the first reading on the 1st is as it is now. So no changes have been made since the December 1st meeting between now. So do we want to continue with um, the motion to table or do we want to um, request amendments to this? Mr. With President, what, yes. you know, um, we've had a workshop on this already and it looked like we're getting into a second workshop or we've already done got into a second workshop. We need a cleaner version. Let's just go, we, all, we already have it moved in second to table it. Let's get a cleaner version. If we need to do a workshop again, let's do a workshop again. But in the middle of a meeting to go into another workshop, it's, it's not necessary. We need to clean it up and go ahead and uh, something that everybody understand and everybody agree with. So let's move forward on this if we can. All right, we have a motion to table and a second. Second. Kenny made the motion to table. 
George seconded it. All in favor? Make it, yeah, we'll make it subject to call. Subject to call. Yes, ma'am. Did you want to make a motion for a, or request a workshop? It was. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. If I, just one further comment in an attempt, a serious attempt at levity. Never assume, Mr. Creel, this council cannot flatten that rabbit one more time. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wish I could understand what he said. All right. Res resolution C. Resolution declaring the intent to grant certain financing to Biloxi Capital LLC for a 1300 hotel, a $700 million project on the former Tivoli Hotel. No more than second. All right, first by George Lawrence, second by Kenny Glavin. All right, do I have any discussion? Uh, Popo, could you break it down what we're trying to do? We're just taking our first step to help these people out, correct? No, it Uh, you know, certainly worth it. So, nothing is going to be pledged till after t the uh, you know the opening, which we feel uh, construction will begin in 21 and doors open 2023. And we have the support of the, the Harrison County right. unanimous supervisors. So all, we all in this together. Our biggest problem is overcoming Michael Watson with his uh, Thailand money. I mean, that was our biggest hurdle. Oh, we have to go still go through the state to finalize well, this, it. This will offset that unreasonable, you know, uh, uh, conditions that he put on it. So th if we do this, we will overcome that obstacle. Uh, and who knows if that goes away, you know, these incentives may, uh, we'll have some flexibility. But this is, you know, in, uh, you know, in, in a way to move this thing forward without risk. I mean, it's good. It's hard to believe that the Secretary of State's against education. A lot, most of this money is funded education, the public uh, health, you know, the police department, the fire department, these are good things. So, I mean, you know, why would you ruin this is another basically boat rise you're trying to build there. Boat rise is 800 million, this is 700 million. That's a ton of people going to go to work once they build it, probably 2,500 people. How can the Secretary of State be against projects like this? It just don't make sense to me. Uh, I agree. Yeah. Right. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other discussion? Yeah, I just wanted to come in on it. Yeah, this Kenny, is a Kenny seconded it, so let him. Kenny seconded it. Second. Yes, yeah, so let him. I'll just make a comment. Huh? Comment. Yeah. No, I was just going to say this is a game changer for uh, for us here on the Gulf Coast here in Biloxi. So I encourage all my colleagues to uh, support this. Go ahead. Yeah, I agree with. Uh, our the rest of the council, I believe, uh, not since the tallest manor has this area generated visitors and tourism, and it's time for this this property to start doing that again. And we have an opportunity. We have the tools and the resources uh, to be able to make it happen. And as the mayor mentioned, they don't get a dime of this uh, incentive unless they produce and start 
uh, making things happen. So to me, it's a game changer. To me, it's what we should do. All right. Any other discussion? All right, I'll call for the question. Well, I'll I leave. do, I have some discussion still. I'm sorry. And I'm not, I read through this. Was, were, is this the one we're projecting $78 million in TIF bonds? No, the no, next one. Doesn't. No, that's the next, that's next one. one. Okay. That's the U Music Broadwater. <laughs> that's deep. That's on the $1.1 billion development. I mean, I get that. It, you know, regardless of what it's on, we still have to be concerned with what our debt servicing leverages us and our ability to repay these bills if something were to happen. Um, okay. Let's, let's That's the next resolution. And then we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss. Okay. No further discussion on C. A call for the question. All in favor? All right. 7 0. All right. Now we'll move to resolution D. Which resolution was that? D, like condemning? Is that the next one? <laughs> resolution declaring the intention to issue TIF bonds in the amount not to exceed $78 million for the redevelopment of the Broadwater property. I have a motion? I'll make that motion. A second. I'll second it. All right, first by Kenny, second by George. Discussion? All right. Uh, not since the Broadwater and the present casino, uh, has this uh, property been as useful as we have an opportunity to to, uh, to develop it now? Uh, we've seen the plans, and, and I know all developers come in and they want to make their big splash, but uh, truly, uh, when you look at the uh, entity that's uh, interested, um, we can support this, and until they produce, they don't earn a dime in the incentives for a true game changer. You're talking 1.1 billion. Nine zeros. That's a B, <laughs> billion dollars. And the jobs and uh, everything that comes with it. So I think it's an exciting opportunity. If they don't produce, they don't get anything. If they do produce, it's a win-win. Thank you. Let, let me, if you don't mind, let me jump in and saying this: the TIF, the seventy-eight million dollars against the one uh, uh, point something billion, uh, as, as Kenny, as, as uh, Councilman Robin mentioned, these bonds. If you know, if this passes, we hope it does unanimously, as as the other one did, will not be sold till after twenty-three, till it's over with. And just like we did the TIF for Walmart. And the, the the percentages is usually different. So it, the the 78 million against the uh, you know the amount of money that that they have equity and what they're going to borrow, and plus the MDA has uh, has sort of blessed with about 210 million dollars worth of their incentive. So the state is all in with regard to what that opportunity is. And our little part of 78 million dollars, which is you know for our infrastructure and some parking that it will be, uh, when not used for events will be open to the public, both on the south and the north side of uh, the highway. There's about $20 million anticipated in the marina, and of course the golf course uh, sitting there. So it's the whole package also, and it will uh, uh, be significant and transformational. Again, the counts, the uh, board of supervisors saw and, and affirmed what we feel that it, that is, is, of course, the wisest course and, and the best thing we can do, given this this point we're in in Biloxi, and given what uh, what the returns can be, but with absolutely no risk and a whole lot to gain. And mayor, that's one point B, like in Biloxi, billion nine zeros behind it. Billion that's right, dollars. That's right. So one point one nine zeros. George, do you have anything? If this is a this is the same day I was saying. Like, is that me? No, no. It's George. It's, it's, it's telling us. That means me. It's George. He's radioactive again. Uh, <laughs> better. Mo better. It is mo better. <laughs> This must be going to be a brilliant hey, statement I'm making or something. <laughs> Give him the portable mic. Where is that? That's good. Yeah, got tiny, tiny ball. <laughs> Get a hand out. It might not be his. Nathan? 
Why couldn't it we have discovered this yeah. eight years ago? <laughs> yeah. It's okay. All right. It was all I was trying to say before everything got so excited there. Yeah. A lot of static. Talk about two billion dollars between two in the city of Biloxi. In the right, city, yeah. in the state of Mississippi, be giving the whole city to get two billion dollars worth of projects. And that's direct. Industry. I'm just saying. But you listen. To me. I'm talking here. All right. You're talking about six thousand people going to work. Want to see place? Six thousand people. Going to work besides probably four or five thousand to build it. <laughs> any, I'm telling you, any city go crazy to think they had two billion dollars and think we had to fight this hard to get this. They should be coming down there just taking care of this problem without any. I mean, two billion dollars in the city of Luxor well, and six thousand employees. Oh, they're giving a hundred years of freebies. <laughs> this is crazy. We have to fight this hard to get this done. I mean, that's really a sin. Well, I mean, let me say, for this project, MDA recognized that too. How many billion dollar projects are going on in the state of Mississippi today, or even next year, or even the following year? So MDA affirmed and confirmed with their, uh, their expansion to tourism uh, uh, tax credit that, worth, that is worth about $210 million if they perform. There's no, there's no downside to this. There's no chances that we take. There's always a chance that we take everything. All all reward comes well, risk. It, well, it, it, there's some risk, but not to us. Well, well, there is because we're the ones that have to guarantee payment of these TIF bonds. That's it, if, 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 if let me are paid with generated tax income. That's what TIFs are paid with. That means we pay the bond back based off the increased revenue generated because they're here. I understand how this After works. After it's completed. That's right. After it's completed. But what about COVID-23 or COVID-24? We have to be prepared. We have to make sure that we can pay for this. This well, you were taught us a lot about managing our finances. To make sure that we have the capability of carrying a bond of this magnitude if something were to go wrong. We, we uh, certainly, that is, is an assessment. As, as we go through orbit around the sun, we go through meteor belts too. So that's, you know, we could get struck by, well, by I, media, but I'm just being cute. But you know, you know. I know you're being humorous. But, uh, but no, it, it is. A, a, you know, the debt service is about, for those bonds, based on, again, projections. We, you know, we, we looked, we just found something at 2.115, okay? The debt service at 5% is 6 million, it's, you know, 6 million. Okay, less than that, I don't know what, what uh, but anyway, no, there's certainly a risk. But, you know, the, uh, the, the, the subsequent, you know, it, uh, a catastrophe or something like that. I, I can't, I don't have the, the magic uh, forecast but for that. Where are we at with our debt servicing right now? How much room do we have? And what do we have falling off that would be available to us in, in 2023 when this projected completion would, would do? Um... Wait a minute. I, I, can't, I can't project that. I can't. Jason's here. He could talk about it. Yeah. None, of this, none of this is against our market. Yeah, Jason. Let me. Jason Thomas is is a, a veteran of helping us with financial advice. We'll we'll kind of give you the outlook on the TIF and the impact to us, and certainly uh, confirm that this is a something that needs to be done. Yes, uh, Council uh, Jason Thomas again, Municipal Advisor from Mississippi. Uh, with the TIF bond, it does not count against your general obligation debt limit. It does not count against your taxing power other than the increment that's pledged. The latest Attorney General's opinions have held that uh, if, for example, the increment wasn't enough to pay the tax for whatever reason, the city would be precluded from paying from other available revenues even if it had other legally available revenues. That's happened in this city before, uh, down at Margaritaville, the original Margaritaville. So it is, it is a risk in the sense that you you have all of this out there. Uh, it could, if the bonds ever went bad, it could be held against the city in the market. But in terms of actual dollars, it cannot, according to current state law. The, the experience on Fifth Street Margarita. That's right. Exactly what's That's going right. on right now. Uh, all that can actually be used, and it's happening down there on the point now, is the money that's coming from that property, which is not currently enough to debt service those bonds. And let me also, uh, in rolling this out, mm -hmm. okay, 
if something is built, you know, we're, we're, of course, the, the ad valorem increase, right. but primarily we would hope to make most of it. But as a backup, like we did at, at the uh, Walmart TIF, we had to use some of the sales tax from that property, not all general sales yes, tax, it's only it's from that property, tax. and yes. only the gaming from that property is it's what we're, we're pledging. General ad valorem and sales tax from that specific property. Okay, thank you. Uh, one last Thank thing. You. I didn't say any day. We passed $21 million bond for the baseball field. <laughs> I'll take the seven or eight million over that baseball field every day. So this thing can create a ton of money. Baseball field will never do that. This has been a big expense to the city. Yep. So, I mean, when you take taking this shot, if they actually build this thing and that put that many people to work, that's, yep. that's what you're looking for in the city of Bluxa. I have to go back to the same thing. Two billion dollars in anybody's city of Mississippi. Two billion dollars? Mm -hmm. They give them the whole world. Mm -hmm. That's unbelievable. So anyway, I'm, I'm all for this one. Thank you. Mr. Tisdale? Uh, yes, do we know roughly when this public hearing that's stipulated will occur for the for, for the county, I think it's the twenty first of uh, January. January. And we would uh, Peter, I don't know. During our December 29th meeting. So December, so a couple of weeks from now, at our last regular meeting in December, we'll have a public hearing on this for those folks who may be interested in commenting. Okay. Okay. Any further discussion? All right. Call for the question. All in favor? Four. Seven zero. Resolution to grant conditional use approval for a bulk fuel storage tank for property identified as 1816 Beach Boulevard and 143 McDonald Avenue. Do we have a motion? I have a first for Ms. Newman. Any, any Sec second? I'll second that. First for Ms. Newman, second for Mr. Tisdale. Any discussion? I do. I'd like to ask just one question. What do you mean by a fuel tank here? What are you actually going to have? What is the purpose of this putting on a piece of land that's nothing there? All this is is a tank that they use to store the gas for the go-karts. That's all it is. It's not a gigantic tank like you'd see back here on the back bay. It's going to be a smaller one, and they have agreed to screen it from public view, so they'll build a fence around it and landscape around it. That's all. Okay. Uh, no, all I could think about one. <laughs> so wait a minute. What are we doing here on the beach? Yeah. No. Okay, I got it. And, it. and it's far enough away from uh, veterans and away from uh, Highway 90 that you won't even notice that it's back in there. Okay. He owns all the way to McDonald's, RW? Uh, I, think he, I think he owns some property on McDonald, but I don't know if it's right in this particular stretch that we're talking about for the go kart track. Okay. Okay. All right, any further discussion? All in favor? Six, seven, Robert's out the room. All right, we'll move to resolution F. Resolution to grant conditional use approval to authorize an existing residence to be utilized as a short term rental for property located at 134 Lee Street. No, I'll move it. Right, I'll second, second it. All right. We have a First hey, from Mr. Lawrence, second from Mr. Tisdale. This house sits uh, towards the beach on Lee Street. This yes, is sir. one of the first houses coming up? It's, a, uh, it's in the 100 block, yes, sir. It's one block off the beach. And we had no one there to oppose it at the uh, planning commission. That was, was that Marion and Williams' old house? The big, like the fortress? No, the, the, no it's the one before that. It's next, it's next, George, it's next door to the the Barisev's house right in there. Oh, the house inside of there, okay. This one has just completely been redone. Right, you've got, yeah. you got where the, I it, think it it's was. It's on the east side. It's you, on the east side of Lee Street. If, if you know. When we that, pass it, then we'll have a commercial piece of property. We'll have the taxes. We'll have the water rates or whatever you do with the water rates. You, you, tax, you tax the water rates. 
Uh, how do you say that? How do you tax water rates? <laughs> That's something that we learned when the uh, state person came down, is that we do have the ability to tax it. Uh, I was just wondering, you, you always say that, tax the water rates. I just didn't know how you could add a tax or something like that. I mean, I don't care how you get it. It should be more. I don't understand that. But. Look at your tax bill next time. Yeah. Look it's, at your water bill next time it comes. Mm -hmm. right. if you, on, on residential, it's not, if it's, if it's designated as commercial, there's a, there's that's a correct. charge that's part of your bill. Sales tax, yeah. on, on, sales tax on the water component. Yep. So all the ones we have, Short-term rentals, uh, we have that listed as taxes. Yes, sir. Like 350, whatever you got. They're, ta they're taxed as a uh, commercial water, business. Tax to collect the more water? Yes, sir. Fee. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion? All right. Call for the question. All in favor? 6-0. Robert's out the room. Resolution to grant conditional use approval to authorize an existing residence to be utilized as short-term rental for property located at 306 4th Street. I move it. Second it. First by Mr. Lawrence, second by Mr. Tisdale. Any discussion? Yeah, but uh, here's another one. You always say we can't do residential neighborhoods. That's what we're doing all of this. This is the guy that you told to go get 22 names of the residents so he can have this property. He created this. One guy created all this problem. I'm gonna vote for it. Yeah. I'm just saying, so don't say we can't have it in residential neighborhoods anymore. Cause that was an 80 year old neighborhood that we turned into short term rental. So anyway, then this, this guy created that. And that's when you said, go back, get all the neighbors to vote for it and you'll get it done. So it's always the way to do it, Jerry. <laughs> uh, my job is to tell them what they're on. Well, I don't care about your job. <laughs> don't go around and say we can't, we're not gonna do residential neighborhoods. We did. That's all. Let's be consistent. Mm -hmm. That's all I ask you all the time. Any other discussion? Yes, I, I, and I'd like to point this out. You may have parts of the city uh, that are residential now, but over the years, as the, the, the businesses or commercial zones have uh, crept closer and closer, there's always that option for folks in a neighborhood or a particular community uh, to come forward to the planning commission follow the LDO and just request a zone change. Or of course, the council can request a zone change, which well, we do or look at, so. If you'll consider back when the casinos were a hot property, a number of property owners in East Biloxi banded together and had their property zoned waterfront. And it's not an easy thing to do if, no. if you're trying to pull, you know, whether it's 10 or 22 families. So, but anyway, uh, that's all, it's my only comment. All right, I'll call for the question. All in favor? All opposed? Um, I wasn't in here, I don't know what you're voting on. 6 0, Robert's not voting. Yes, he was out of the room. So he doesn't. All right. Do I have a motion for the consent agenda? Move. Oh. Move. Okay. Okay. All right, I need to make a motion to suspend the rules to add re a resolution previously tabled subject to call. And that was um, on November 17th, item N, which was dealing with the downtown housing incentive pilot program. It was moved by Tisdale and Glavin. Pre previously, yeah. On, and then we tabled it subject to call, and I think that do we have a copy of this? Is it? Oh. Peter, what, what is it? Who's calling it? Peter asked for us to. Okay. Yeah, this was. Um, this was. <laughs> this Do was uh, a question George had on what is it was a fifty thousand dollar difference adding to the budget, and uh, I was put on the spot. I didn't have any of the paperwork in front of me, so I asked for it to be tabled. What it was was the. Uh, Sweatman Drug Store, they received a $50,000 grant, but they received it in the week just before the budget year. So this is just trying for us to balance the budget from the end of the fiscal year 
to allow for that. That's what that resolution did. And I think we talked about that after the meeting. So we're, we need, it was tabled subject to call. So we just need to yeah, get that back on so we can get the budget balanced. You just pretty much verifying what we did. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. It was just right on, it was, the grant was given right on the, the budget year where the check I think was probably paid out October 1st or 2nd. And did you list on there, Peter, what we have left to give out money-wise? That was another part of that question. Peter, is there a reason why we can't just put it on next week's so we can actually look at this? Sure, if we remember to do it. We, we meant to do it last week and we forgot to, last time, so I forgot to do it, so. Well, I'll make a note, we'll make sure it's on the 29th. Okay, that's fine. I'll do that. That's fine. That's good enough. So, so somebody great. make a note of that in the administration. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Someone, someone, okay. Instead of subject to call, it can be subject to call on the 29th. I'll do that, right. I move to consent. We'll move on. Do wait, I have a wait? There's a you asked for a motion. There is no motion. There right? is no motion. I no just one, no one first that. or second at anything. Yeah. So. so I'll move to consent agenda. I think they did. I'll second it. You just didn't hear it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we have a first. Who was that? George? George. Who second? Me. And Paul. Second the consent agenda. Do I have any discussion? Yes, uh Mike on these uh these two things, what are you talking about, a shade cover? That's just like the 10 things over the, the playground at Miramar Park and the one at the point? Is yeah, that just this is item, item E and F. Those are shade structures, meaning they're basically, you know, canvas covers over the parks. And those are both uh, Hurricane Nate re reimbursements. Mm -hmm. so they're, they're both reimbursable projects. We build them, we build them, we send the invoice to FEMA, they pay us. Okay. And then the next three are, where's Pete at? Which one are you asking? Got H, I, and J. You got First Amendment, Second Amendment, and First Amendment. So, which you, these are the steps on the short, uh, no, short term running. Yeah, H, I, and J, ah. that's, uh, that's Peter's territory. That's yeah. three. Hi, Peter. Those three, H, I, J. And all three of these are 90 days extension. That's right. Okay. Uh, number eight, so that's the new house at the end of Cedar, Cedar and the Beach. Uh, yeah. Just off the beach in Cedar. Uh, I is one of the houses that was moved from uh, Division Street. And J is uh, the restoration of the house on Main Street. Okay. And another one on L is uh, Sparklight. Sparklight is uh, our city uh, bill for uh, internet services for the whole city. That is the whole city employee group, not the whole city. That's, that's about $1,000 a month. That's our cable bill. I said the one on the P's and that one. What are we exactly? We just accepted money here for the Coon Street because I don't like a lot of design with the Coon Street. This is not doing anything but what? All right, P, Q, R, and S are all recognizing the grants that have been given to us by DMR and the Tidelands uh, grants for the last year. Those were approved by the legislature and the grant application has been provided to us. And that's one's Coon Street, one's Hiller Park, one's Eagle Point cleanup, which is just a done deal. That's, they're just paying us off and we're done. And the last one is the, 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 the Eagle Point Park development. That's four, four Titans projects that we got last year. This is just another step in the process of recognizing the money into the budget. But we're just taking it a moment. We're not, we're not doing any, accepting any particulars of design, like at no, Coon Street. No. Because they have a lot of problems with all that. No, well, the next, the I'll next take step, the money. On, on the one in particular you're asking about Coon Street, a design contract has already been awarded. 
and they're working against that, that budget. At some point, you'll see a, probably a draft of a design. We obviously, for $200,000, can't build that. That's, that that'll have to be a, an, another grant later on. And this is one of the things DMR is doing to us right now. Is a lot of times in the first year, they'll just give us enough money to do design and wait to see what, how it comes out. Same, the same is going to be the case on Hiller Park. Hiller Park is under is where you'll see a design contract probably at either the next meeting or the week after with Seymour Engineering for a design contract. Now that we have the money to to uh, to do that, when you accept this money, you just put it in the general fund, or you put it in these accounts. It stays in the general fund in the capital in the capital project fund. Okay. It's it's just funny money. Councilman, it's, you know, not, we don't have the cash. We just have the promise. Okay, and another one is CC. Charlie, Charlie. Could you break that down for us? This is supposed to be a good thing, isn't it? That's a good thing. That is uh, seniors who happen to have, or actually it's mostly seniors, it's uh, residents who have United Healthcare as their provider, if they, go and uh, exercise and swim in our Snyder pool, the health, the health provider pays us to, to let them do that. So, so we get a check, I think I have written down $15 a month we get for any of the people that on, are on United Healthcare that are using our pool. It's not a lot of money, but every little bit that counts. And um, the DD, How's that working with uh, the stadium since we're not hosting a lot of people? How's this, this, terms, how's this poor guy making his, it? The terms in his lease agreement allow for him to not be paying it when, when COVID is preventing him from operating. Okay. So it's basically establishing his rate that he would be, he would be paying us once he's able to open again. Right now he's not allowed to open. And it's, uh, something you may explain to everybody, it's just, uh, Ban Wango or whatever this thing's supposed to be doing. What are we doing here with Ban, Ban Wango? What is that? Probably confusing that with the dance Fandango, but <laughs> yes. <laughs> but Fandango, this that is a destination experience engine where residents and or uh, tourists can go online and look at places in Biloxi to go and and make reservations. Right now, the only thing in, 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 in for Biloxi that's a Biloxi city attraction is the lighthouse. But also the Oro Keith Museum and the Mardi Gras Museum are on there where an a resident could use that software to, to find those. The aquarium and other, other facilities on the coast are in that. It's just a, a destination experience engine. Don't, uh... Mm. You, you, the one we're selling the five trucks, or we sell them to somebody, are you going to bid them, or are we going to donate them? I know once before we donated them to smaller towns, but you look like you sell them both of these. The, the, the reading on the resolution talks about uh, working that through a, a certified uh, auctioneer, if you will, an auction house. So both of them we still have the option to give it away, but this is this uh, this resolution uh, basically only only thing it does is it, it makes the uh, items surplus so that we can do something with them. So those two fire engines are now, if you vote yes, will now be surplus equipment. Okay, uh, that's all mine. I'll leave TT for uh, Robert. <laughs> Robert likes some uh, Mr. Tisdale main things. <laughs> So I'll leave uh, TT. No, nah, it's uh, on. Yeah, there, there are three items. I just want to comment on item MM. This is Bandwango. I just knew that was a typo, thinking it was Bandwagon, but no, it's Bandwango. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. let's all get on the Bandwango. Mm -hmm. uh, but my, my thinking was, and I mentioned this to Mr. Leonard, I just throw it out there. Uh, if if we're gonna if we were to build that lighthouse pier back uh, a little longer, I'm sure we're limited with the channel out there, uh, concrete pilings or whatever, a little higher. Uh, folks have pointed out that they have these kinds of piers in Florida and other locations, and they charge you to use those piers, whether it's three dollars to go out, 
You could have a commercial establishment out there if you wanted to put a restaurant or uh, a, a food vendor out there. You could sell fishing licenses or whatever, but anybody who wanted to use that pier would pay three bucks, be open 24 seven. It's just a thought, something to think about or not think about over the holidays. But a couple of folks had mentioned that to me and I'm thinking, oh, well, okay. Um, Councilman the, Tisdale, we need to get a Thailand lease. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, there's a lot of things we need. True. To get, no, no, I, I, well, yeah, that's true. Thank goodness, thank goodness our Secretary of State is helping us whenever yeah, he can. He's helping. Uh, item NN, this is, uh, I'd urge you to vote to approve that. I'm, I'm, I feel confident you will. This is to resurface DeBees Road, and that's all we're doing is we're resurfacing DeBees Road from Pass Road north to Runnymede. Right, that's right. And mill, mill and replace, right? <laughs> mill and replace, yeah. Right. right, and uh, of course at the very end, north end on the Gulfport side of the bees there at Running Me, the community college on their campuses is, is finishing a, a major construction project. I would assume they'll be done shortly. So this, with any luck, this might take place in February or March or. This is, the, this is a resolution to ask the county and the city of Gulfport to do officially what they've informally promised us they'd do. Right, so. We're asking for their commitment at this point. And hopefully we'll get it. Okay. And item double P, I just want to point out, these are the council meetings for next calendar year. And we're meeting on April 7th, which is a Wednesday and not a Tuesday because uh, that Tuesday, April 6th, is uh, an election primary date. So that's all I wanted to point out. Thank you. All right. Any other discussion? Okay. Um, on TT, Tango Tango. Tango Tango. The, um, it's just unclear as to what the resolution is doing. Is this ending an eminent domain or is this just removing one name of an owner, property owner? And then we'll see a new resolution for that property individually. Great, then I can vote against that one too. All right, Felix. Yeah. Uh, Mike Leonard, I just wanted to maybe later on ask a question if um, Bush Park uh, qualifies for one of those canopies that you're getting for Miramar Park, but could you check that out for me? Check out whether Bush Park qualifies yeah. for a sage shade structure, okay. Was there one there before? Was there one there before? Yes. yes. There was? Okay. Yes. I'll ask. I'm not sure why we only had doing the two. Okay. Yeah. If you do two, you might as well do three. I'll, I'll give you an answer. I'll give you an answer. That's it. I can hmm. Ms. Newman? Discussion? Mr. Glavin, do you have any discussion? <laughs> <laughs> Croatia. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a comfortable chair. I got yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, The only question I have, Christy, on the R, was the 40000 did that pay back what we put into that on the cleanup of the canals? Right. I think Zeta finished it. She yeah. <laughs> just pushed it all in. Right. So yeah. We, when, Yes, that just paid back what we paid to clean it from the last storm. So we didn't spend any more than that because I know it was limited what they could give us yes. in that, that deal. So I was just what's, making sure we recovered. What's our most money. useful, Councilman, is that it, the money was came, came from Tidelands. And you remember initially they said it wasn't eligible for Tidelands. Yes. And I think now they've committed that the, the important thing is long term. Yeah, it's those canals and and. and They've made the case that those canals in Eagle Point are a Thailand. Yes. Okay. All right. That's that's the only thing I had, and I had question on TT, but um, Robert covered that. Any further discussion? All right. We'll call for the question. 
All in favor of the consent agenda? 6-0 with Kenny out of the room. And any exceptions? No? Okay. Okay. Okay, so no exceptions? Okay. Okay. So, all right. So, no exceptions. All right. We'll move on to code enforcement hearings. Mr. Krill. Item A, Allegiant Equities, LLC, 2660 Beach Boulevard. This property is still in violation. All right. Do we have anyone here to speak on behalf or against Allegiant Equities LLC at 2660 Beach Boulevard. All right, if not, this case is closed. Yeah. Item B, Catherine Souris, Zero Rodenburg Avenue. This property is still in violation. Is there anyone here to speak on behalf or against Catherine S. Soros at Rodenburg Avenue. All right, if not, this case is closed. Item C, RW Development, LLC, 105 McDonald Avenue. This property is still in violation, but I talked to Mr. Woolrich yesterday, and he said if we would give him an extension, he'd see to it that it's removed. How many days you need? He said just after the first of the year, but if we give him 30 days, I'm sure it'll be gone well before that. I make that, that motion 30 Second. days. All right, first by Mr. Moves. Lawrence, second <coughs> by Mr. Deming. All, all in, do we need to get a, all in favor? 6-0. All right, that closes code enforcement hearings. Do I have a motion for the routine agenda? Move. Moved. First by Mr. Lawrence, second by Mr. Tisdale. Mr. Lawrence. Uh, Mr. Rowdy, where we at? Give us some good news there. Christmas time, a little good news. Let's see if we can get this work. So last week we received uh, 974000 back in advances and reimbursements from MEMA. <clears throat> and currently we have $1.465 million, which I hope to have here before December 25th. And we're working on about another 970000 for the month of January. So we're, we're doing well. That's good. Those that kind of reports you want to hear. That's a good thing. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Right. Mr. Tisdale? Not a thing. All right. Any other discussion? All in favor? 6 0. And <coughs> do I have a motion to recess? So moved. Second. First, Tisdale. Second, Lawrence. All in favor? 6 0. Everyone have a Merry Christmas. I need to talk to you. Hey, Jerry. Hey. <coughs>